Welcome to another episode of The Right Stuff, a co-production of the Writer's Block of the Eastern Shore and PAC-14 Television. I'm your co-host, Andy Nunez. My other co-host, Dr. Johnny Hayes, is on another assignment, but we'd like to welcome you here to another great interview with our guest today, who is Alita Davis from the board of Poplar Hill Mansion. Mm -hmm. Alita, nice to have you on the show. Thank you, Andy. It's really wonderful to be here. And, and so nice of you to let me come in to talk about my book because this is my first book. Yes, and we're all excited about that and we're going to talk about it in just a minute. But first we want to talk a little bit about who you are for the folks that, okay. you know, don't haven't seen you on some of the other shows and, and then we'll get into a little bit more about the book. So tell us, uh, you know, where you're from, where you grew up and a little bit about your background. Okay, well originally I'm from way up in the mountains in Pennsylvania. Um, it's up near Altoona and Punxsutawney, a very small town, Du Bois, and I lived all you know, all around Du Bois in that uh, Du Bois in Pennsylvania in that area um, before moving to Wilmington, Delaware, for a few years, and then I settled here. And um, so I've been here since I was about 15 years old. Um, still mountain person at heart, though. I still miss that part of the country, and. Um, uh, I ended up here with my father when he was transferred, but um, I live in Newtown now, which is our historic district, and I'm very drawn to history, and the older the better, as far as I'm concerned. So living in Newtown, of course, we're near Poplar Hill Mansion, and I be, um, was, became friends with the curator and ended up uh, joining the board, and now I'm the chairman of the board and very involved with the mansion and all of the wonderful things that are part of the history. Okay, and let's talk a little bit about the mansion then because it's going to be the subject, it's mm -hmm. what we're going to be talking about today. Um, Poplar Hill Mansion is, let's give a little short history, it's how old and... Okay, it's the oldest um, documented home in Salisbury and it is the only federal house that was left if we had any others they were burned during the Great Fire so it's our only federal home and because of the historic value it is um, owned by the city and kept up as a small um, house museum and our board takes care of running all of the events that happen to raise money to do restoration preservation projects uh, as well as doing a lot of really fun things for the the public historical events such as the civil war show um, high teas um, uh, lectures, just anything we can think of that's going to be interesting that people would like to do. The writer's block, wonderful local authors um, that we hold at least one meeting a year mm -hmm. and uh, it's we just have a lot of fun there and we've done a lot of projects um, since I've been on the board. Okay, and, and I suppose that this new book of yours uh, dovetails right into one to a project. It does. Because um, for our audience out here, um, Alita and I have spent some time over to Poplar Hill talking about mm -hmm. the various aspects of Poplar Hill, uh, its history uh, and uh, its inhabitants. But one of the things that isn't generally talked about when we talk about the wonderful things that Poplar Hill does is the fact that there seems to be paranormal activity mm -hmm. at Poplar Hill. So tell us a little bit about that background. Well, almost every old home and some new homes have um, spirit energy attached, whether it's something that happened there, good or bad. Um, most people don't realize that this aspect of life is around them because they just they go about their daily life and if there's nothing um, like a really um, malevolent haunting or something, you normally don't hear about it. But I think what we don't realize that it's not just malevolent spirit activity. Um, I think most of us grow up believing that there's life after death. When you die, you go on to another life. Well, it shouldn't be so hard to believe then that that, that activity, that energy is around us all the time. People believe that they have angels or spirit guides or family, you know, loved ones that are with them. Well, that's very nice, but you don't realize that those people are out there, that energy from the people who have passed on is around us all the time. And maybe we don't notice it until maybe we're, we have to call on somebody for help. 
we don't even realize we're just we need help and then suddenly something happens that we can't quite understand and um, the I never thought about uh, um, hauntings or anything when I came on the board at Poplar Hill Mansion it was a gradual thing um, working on the board I'd never had experiences of any type no, no one in my family did um, it was just that being in Poplar Hill Mansion day after day, we started noticing some strange things that they really could not be explained. And then doing research, we found that these had happened over the decades and even back as far as the Waller family, who were the second residents of the, the home from about um, 1860 or 70 through 1940. And there are reports as far back as oh, I guess the 19, or 1900s, about strange noises and, and activity in the nursery and things that couldn't be explained by Mrs. Waller. And um, Mrs. Garber, who lived there, also had problems with the nursery. She had many things happen. So listening to these stories and being there, I, I kind of took it with a grain of salt until I started having some things happen myself and there was no explanation for them. So over a period of time, this, these things kind of collected in my mind. And then we started having paranormal investigations. And Maryland Society of Ghost Hunters, I believe, was our first group that came out. And Andy, I don't know, did you come? Were you at? I don't second time. Second time. And, but it was very interesting. But still, you know, we got some interesting little photographs um, of energy orbs and rods that are considered to be spirit energy that cannot manifest. These um, orbs are dense balls of light mm -hmm. that seem to have a nucleus in the center um, that's a more dense form. And then the little rods are energy that sort of moves around um, gravestones, windows, banisters. They're little long columns with bright, tiny orbs of light in them. So that was kind of fascinating. But um, I think what really convinced me to write the book was all of the documentation over time, the different investigators who came out, but more than that were the mediums who came to the house. And mediums are specially gifted. Mm -hmm. And we would have people from all around the country that knew nothing about the house, and every time they came through the house, we'd hear the same things. So it was pretty, pretty, um, I thought it was, it would, you couldn't really dis uh, debunk any of this with all the documentation we had, plus what I had had happen and my board members had had happen and the various curators. Um, so that in itself, it was like the book was in my mind, but I'd never written a book before and I didn't have any idea how to write a book or how to go about getting it published. So uh, I was thinking about it. We had had um, the, a tea um, recipe book written by um, our board members and uh, at the mansion mm -hmm. and they used a small publisher local publisher saltwater media. saltwater media so and then i thought okay i can get some help from her maybe i can actually write a book so a couple thoughts were going through my mind and all of a sudden spirit history of poplar hill mansion just popped right in my mind and and you and, wrote the book with and that today. is actually the name of the book spirit mm -hmm. history of poplar hill mansion mm -hmm. and um although i don't have psychic powers like not specially gifted like uh, mediums but I do have some really strong things that come to mind that I have to act on and this was one of them and not long after I told a friend of mine that I was writing the book and what the name was going to be um, a medium came to the house and she talked to him and said well Alita is going to write a book he said tell her she has to write it and she has to do it now and that is exactly well. what I went by. And, and you can think this is coincident or not, but the night, um, the day after this was published, when I brought it to the mansion, the writer's block meeting was there. Mm -hmm. I was in the emergency room that night. And I have, wouldn't have been able to write for about three weeks. I never would have gotten the book out. Wow. So it's one of those little things. You can call it intuition. You can call it being a little more attuned to... Uh, what's out there that guides us, but that's the reason the book actually got done when it did. Well, and that's that's a subject that has recurred with happenings going around in Poplar Hill 
mansion because that intuition that said mm-hmm. write it now uh, reminds me of another story of, a, of an event that took place at Poplar Hill when one of the curators fell down the stairs. Mm, that's a good one. Yeah, and um, supposedly, um, according to what the medium said, mm-hmm. she was actually saved from falling all the way down the stairs by one of the spirits who actually stopped her fall, mm-hmm. and he had a prophecy for her. Uh, you want to elaborate on that? Well, she fell down the step. Uh, it was funny because she had she always wore these thick flip-flop things mm-hmm. th- with the real thick soles, and she was coming down the steps. And um, apparently what the medium said was that it was Dr. Houston, who was the Dr. John Houston was the doctor who moved in with his family, the first people who lived there. And um, he saved her. Apparently, she said when she was falling, she knew there was no way she could reach the rail to catch herself, and all of a sudden her hand was on the rail, the the banister. And um, when the medium heard about this, or she was telling her something had happened, and Nancy, uh, she said, well, the curator says, oh, yes, this happened. I fell down the steps. She said, that was Dr. Houston that put your hand there. And uh, then he said something about her heart, having an episode with her heart or something to watch that area of her body. And something, she did have an, um, uh, something that happened that she was hospitalized for. But you might think, okay, this doesn't sound realistic, but we've had many people, mediums, who have said that they have heard, seen Doctor uh, a man. They didn't know it was Dr. Houston because they don't know the history. They've seen a man coming down the front steps. So my thought is, did they cross? Did their paths cross? He just happened to be coming down when she fell, or did she fall and he appeared to help save her? So, um, again, we have this happening, then we have the mediums telling us there's, uh, I see a man coming down the steps, um, you know, dark, uh, dark vest, dark pants, white shirt, over and over. Um, we, we just have this happening repeatedly with various things. And there's a whole group of people that are actually attracted to such things, so it's not necessarily a negative thing, no. I would imagine. No, no because it, it would draw more people for a tourism, you know, from a tourism point of view also, because I've noticed mm-hmm. over the years more and more paranormal groups have taken an interest in coming in and, yes. you know, doing research and investigation at the mansion. So it, it's a good thing. Now, we talked about earlier the incidences in the nursery mm-hmm. uh, that as far back as when the Wallers owned it right yes. up until the present time, there have been incidents in the nursery. There was a tragic event that occurred in that nursery. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, this um, this goes back to as far back as anybody remembers at the mansion um, about um, well how the, the the ghost or spirit story started. Um, there was a young slave. Um, we call her Sarah. We don't really know what her name was. It's not documented. But she was the children's nanny, and apparently her skirt caught fire in the fireplace, and she did die as a result of her burns. But people over the years, as far back as the Wallers, have reported hearing sounds of cleaning, windows opening, um, a broom sweeping, which I myself heard, not way before I ever knew there was any story about it. I had a really rather uncomfortable experience there, one bright sunny afternoon, which again dispels the thing that you have to be after midnight, it has to be a dark stormy day. No, that energy is around us all the time and most of what we experience in the mansion is during the day while we're working or while we're there concentrating, you know, doing book work or just very quiet states, um, things will happen. And um, it's Another thing I want to dispel while we're talking about this um, is the fact that all historic homes have negative hauntings. Um, You know, you think if it's an old home, there's going to be something scary. Well, it might be a little scary to us because we don't understand it, but it's not all negative. It's not negative energy. And really, we don't have that at Poplar Hill Mansion. What we have seems to be the um, energy of a family who who lived there for the first time and loved the place and the people who worked for them over the many decades. 
Well, good. But well, it's, it's still, it's spooky to us, you know. Sure. You're not expecting something to happen when you're sitting there quietly um, working on a project and you hear a door open. Right, or a clock that's broken chime. Yes, you know, which, which we I do all said. the time. Yeah. And what's really funny is it seems like, you know, um, if, they got, if there's a sense of humor on the other side, they seem to have it because often we're talking about paranormal activity in the mansion and what you people believe this or they don't believe it and all of a sudden the clock will chime. Exactly. And some people have said, well, a clock's going to chime. It's from vibration. Well, I don't know then why is the clock downstairs? Why does that never chime? We have two floor clocks. It's only the one upstairs, and it doesn't matter where that sits, whether it's been on the floor, the landing of the hall, um, the upstairs, or if it's all the way up in the second floor, it's chimed both places. Right. Well, let's talk a little bit about the creation of your book. I will say I was compelled. That mm -hmm. is absolute. Um, I've always enjoyed writing. I've written po many poems. I've written a lot of little short articles and things. And I really loved the process of writing, but I didn't know how to write. And when you're writing, you're not even sure if your grammar's right, if you've got the sentence structure, so many things you aren't sure of. But my first reason to write the book is, are you a writer or a technician? I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. Somebody else can do the technical work. The main thing is to get a good story out there when you're a writer. That's your job. Just like an artist, you need to paint your story um, or dance or sing. Um, when I decide, as I said, I had other book ideas in my mind and nothing, not even thinking about writing, just playing with the ideas. And Spirit History of Poplar Hill Mansion came into my mind right in the middle of thinking about a children's book I was going to do. So. Once that happened, I, I just knew I, I had to get started. And so I just kind of jotted, started jotting notes down. And the funniest thing happens, and this happens for many writers and painters as well, since I'm an artist and I'm a, a performer, when you get in the zone, it just happens and you don't know how it happens. And if you try to break it down, say you're a dancer, and you're doing this really fast, complex thing, and you're sitting there trying to break down the steps, you can't dance. <laughs> you just go out there and do it. It's muscle memory. So it was the same way with the book. When I sat down and started jotting notes down, the book just took form. And basically, once I started, I had, I've changed very little in the book. I went back and made a few corrections or changed where I wanted um, something that happened to happen. But it just, it was almost like the book wrote itself. And you probably know that, Andy, as an author. They're um, the best kind. <laughs> yes. And, and I was even told by a me the, uh, the medium that said, you need to do this now. He said, when you're writing, don't force it. If, don't sit down. Some writers, some writers sit down from 9 to 4 every day and write. I... I don't know how they do it. Maybe it's just so natural or they're so gifted, it just comes out. But for me, I found that I would be sitting, really sitting there comfortably on the couch watching television, and all of a sudden, I'd spirit book, right. go write, cool. spirit. Cool. And I would at literally get up from what I was doing comfortably, sit down and start writing. Now, you did it all, you did it on the computer? On the computer, mm -hmm. yes. Okay. So once you got to where you wanted it, mm -hmm. uh, and you assembled, you, you assembled the photos at that time, or did you do it later? In the I did that later. Okay. Be, um, that's the hardest part for me because I'm not really good with the computer, and my computer is not up to what most people need to do this kind of a project. Mm -hmm. So I had to get help with um, um, our curator Sarah mm -hmm. to to get some of the pictures that I knew we had in in our. Uh, computer file system and get those sent to me and then sent off to the publisher and then she put them where she wanted to in the book. It didn't matter to me. Okay. Um, I kind of wanted them really in the center but it, it, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter. That was just that they were there. Okay, so now we're kind of drifting into step two. Step one, you wrote the book. Mm -hmm. Step two, you went to Saltwater Media yes. and um, you talked to Stephanie Fowler who yes. runs Saltwater and um, tell us about your experience. Well, um, 
it, I really like Saltwater Media. First of all, it's a local publisher. We're, we're local writers, and it seemed a good idea to use a local publisher, not only for the convenience, because especially with a new author, you've got a million questions, and you've got to go back and forth. And they're in Berlin, so it's not too mm -hmm. far. And woman-owned, two women. Mm -hmm. So that's another nice reason to support them. It's a small business. And um, Stephanie was very helpful. I couldn't have I, I couldn't have done some, I mean, I had the story, but she helped make sure that it was in the right, the proper, you know, most, it wasn't, I don't think she had changed too much, which was good for me to hear, mm -hmm. but still, I knew that I didn't have to worry about that technical aspect. As I said, I didn't, that's not my thing. My thing is the story, and she did her part beautifully and put it together, and then we went over the book and proofed it, and um, you have, usually you have a two or three pages of little errors that have right. to be fixed. And then you'll notice a couple other ones over time sometimes. But um, that doesn't bother me because I've read many, many books, and almost all of them have some kind of a mistake somewhere in the book. That's no big deal. Right. That doesn't bother me. But she was very easy to work with. And I don't know, I guess for to be an author is one thing, but it's, it's a, any kind of art. You've got to get started first, mm -hmm. and if it's too daunting, you're never going to do it. And she helped me through the process. I went down and talked to her about my idea and what I wanted to do, and she just um, allayed any fears I had that I had to worry about having all the punctuation perfectly or the sentence structure right. She would fix whatever I didn't have right. Okay. So it was a wonderful experience. So, and once you got the book laid out mm -hmm. and all ready to go, and they ran through their wonderful machine over there, yes. the espresso uh, book it machine. It just builds a book. <laughs> right. So you, got, you actually watched it. Yes. It's wonderful. It has little glue beads that look like those things you put in the water, bath oil beads, yes. mm -hmm. that, that binds the, the book, and they just put the thing in there, and it builds the entire book. It's wonderful. It's great. So, uh, so, so the book was published. And um, you're happy with the with the way it turned out? I am happy. It's a small book, but it's exactly what I wanted it to be. And um, again, I guess for those, what would you say for those people who don't don't believe? I would say read it anyway. Sure. Read it. See where our perspective. Our perspective is coming from your perspective. We came in the house just to be on the board, just to do things, preservation projects. We never knew we would be in the middle of something that would build into um, a, a book or a whole series of events. Um, and I think we want to say, too, that the paranormal groups and the people who come out are very respectful, and it's more scientific, wouldn't you say, than anything? The ones, uh, they're, they're becoming the more high-tech all the time, yes. yes uh, with the all kinds of electronic gadgets and things like that. But it's really neat to be sitting there at the computer looking at a camera in a room and all of a sudden see this big swath of mist come across the room with a ball of, a ball of energy in the front of it. That's pretty hard. That's not dust. This is a large it's a big piece of dust. This is <laughs> large. It's a little hard. And um, I think the best thing I could say, if you don't understand what what this book would be about by listening to me, or if you have doubts and about my sanity, <laughs> you should read the book and see how we're coming from. Oh man, this can't be true. This is what you know. This is this is nuts. To see how this evolved into. Um, a really pretty wonderful thing that's that we have at the mansion. Yeah, it's almost like a symbiotic thing, you know, like the the staff and the spirits uh -huh. kind of interact in a way that, um, you know, it's not threatening. Well, that's exactly. I, I've talked to people that were that were curators there many years ago, and people that were on the board. Well, nothing ever happened to me. Well, no. If you don't open the door, nothing's going to come in. And I'm saying uh, if, if your mind is open to other possibilities and if you hear things and you, you really consider where did that come from or you see something or something, something happens that you can't explain over and over. Mm -hmm. And then you have mediums come in and they're talking about, well, this person is here. There's the, you know, this, there's the man coming down the stairs. The, the nursery or the dining room was used as Dr. Houston's surgery. 
um, whatever it is, it all adds up. It all becomes part of what we are experiencing. And all of a sudden, you don't feel like you're so crazy. And we have many authors out there now, Sylvia Brown, um, Teresa Computer, The Long Island Medium. If you read any of their work, this all uh, clarifies what we're going through at the mansion. And the, the end of the book kind of tied it up. What made it so wonderful was the medium that we talked to from Portugal, who doesn't know, can't speak English, and he read right into the house. And as you said, Andy, apparently since we've begun to acknowledge, hey, guess what, maybe there's something else here, we're getting more response from them. Well, there you go. We're getting, we're getting, they're under, they're, we're open and we are getting some interesting things, and um, it's pretty, pretty wonderful, exciting. We've already got Spirit Two in the works. There you go. But it's not going to be, it's not going to be any time soon because everything in this book is absolutely true, mm -hmm. and true to the best of our knowledge right. and the people that we have talked to. Mm -hmm. So that was another thing that was important to me: not put anything out here that was not true, as far as we could, um, as far as we're, we can be aware. Sure. Okay. Well, we're running low on time, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, what this book does for Poplar Hill and where it's you know and and why it's important to Poplar Hill. So tell us, um, tell us where you you know why you had the book at Poplar Hill and uh, what happens with it. Well, this book is only at Poplar Hill Mansion we've chosen it's not out there anywhere else because first of all since this is about Poplar Hill Mansion part of the money for the book goes to the mansion that's always part of what we do there and um, it makes me feel good that a project that I took on is helping the mansion to make a little bit of money and um, it's a it's a very interesting book to read I've gotten really good um, feedback from people um, like I didn't want it to end, you know. It's it's it needed to be like a lot longer because I was I just really liked reading about it. So it's um, it's just a part of everything, the whole history of Poplar Hill Mansion, all the people who have lived there. Um, I think it's pretty wonderful to think, whether you believe it or not, that we may, um, when we are gone from this world, we still we yeah. still live on and we're very active. If if we can go by what we have at the mansion, we're very active after we're gone from this world. Now, if people want to come and visit the mansion, of course, they, the mansion has a website, yes. and, and you have a Facebook page. Yes. Uh, and uh, people can um, call, mm -hmm. or they, you have uh, free open tours on... First and third Sunday of every month from and, 1 to 4. Right. And you're over on Elizabeth Street in, yes. in Salisbury. So. And you just like to see what a scientific investigation is, let us know, because we put them together. We only have 10 people at a time. About That's our average size that comes to the mansion. Um, so uh, let us know, and we'll get a group together. We have a couple nice groups that will come out whenever we have the the demand by the by our public. Okay. And um, as I said, everything in the uh, book is part of the mansion, so this part of the money is going towards the mansion. And that's wonderful. Okay. Well, we're out of time. Thank and, you. Uh, we, you know, we could talk about this all day, but I know <laughs> it's just not possible. So, folks, um, first I want to thank my guest today, Alita Davis. Uh, from the board of Poplar Hill Mansion, and we're all excited about our new book, Spirit History of Poplar Hill yes. Mansion, you know, which, <laughs> you know, um, helps take care of the mansion's many expenses because if you've got an 1805 house, it's, it's got a lot of upkeep. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a good project, it's a good thing, but um, we're out of time. So on behalf of the Writer's Block of the Eastern Shore, my co-host, Dr. Gianni Hayes, and Pack 14 Television, which you should also support as vigorously as possible to keep local shows like Writer's Block and other wonderful programs that you watch here on Pack 14 going. Please support this effort as much as possible. This is Andy Nunez thanking you and telling you to have a wonderful day on Delmarva. Would you like to see your community organization or nonprofit group featured on PAC-14? To get started, contact us at 410-677-5014 or visit our website at www.pac14.org.
PAC-14 is a great way to connect with your community.